Well, hello there, everyone. How are ya? Welcome to Back to Ashes. It's me, Phoenix. Let me start off by saying, if you are new here and you begin to like what you are hearing, please hit that subscribe button. It's free and make sure you don't forget the bell. Set that one to all so you'll be notified of every time I upload a video. Also, if you'd like to become a member of Back to Ashes or would like to gift me a coffee, all the information can be found down below. Now, before we go ahead and get into these stories, this topic does disturb some people, so I will do my best to keep all of the really graphic stuff out of the video. Also, if my voice sounds gritty or deeper, it's because I'm getting over, I don't know, my allergies suck. They really do, so... If my voice sounds weird, I'm not doing it deliberately. <laughs> all right, so with all that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack or tuck in and get warm. And prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Kidnapped Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Another disclaimer, some of these stories may contain material not suitable for all. Listener discretion is highly advised. If you or someone you know happens to be missing or kidnapped, please reach out to the police or one of these hotlines if you are able to. I will leave the link to the national hotlines in the description. First thing. I have a very short but creepy story. I live in a town in Canada with a population of 36,000. The town that I live in is known for the strange and extremely creepy people that roam the street, both day and night. When I was around 10 years old on a summer night, about 8 p.m., I do believe, so while the sun was still going down, I was outside the front of my house by myself riding my skateboard. I was about to go inside before it got too dark when I noticed something out of place. Across the street, I see an old beige minivan with very tinted windows. I noticed some sort of light or flash coming from the driver's side window, almost as if he was taking a picture. Before I knew it, an old lady opens the door of the van and starts walking extremely fast towards me. It was happening so fast that I didn't get a good look at her. As soon as she was walking fast towards me, I grabbed my skateboard and ran inside and locked the door. Once I was inside, I ran to my bedroom at the front of the house. To my dismay, the van was gone. I never told anyone about this encounter because I always thought I was overthinking it. I never knew the lady's intention, and honestly, I do not want to. Creepy lady with the minivan, let's not meet. All right, this is my first time telling this story, so... I'm sorry, English is not my first language. Anyways, this happened at school when I was around four or five. I remember that I spent the day to the zoo with the rest of the class and we were going back to school on the bus. So the bus finally stopped three or four meters away from the school's doors and everyone got off the bus to join the class. It turns out that I was the last one leaving. Even the teachers had left. So. I was about to enter the school's playground when a woman called out of her car to me and called me right in front of the open school door. Hi, sweet boy. Do you want to go to the zoo with me? And at this moment, I had a weird feeling. I knew something bad was happening. How could this woman know I went to the zoo and why would she ask me to go with her? I couldn't think. I was like paralyzed, and she just got closer and closer again. She was about two meters from me, and as she walked to me, I felt a strong grip on her wrist and not heavily pulled into the school's ground. I looked up, and I saw my teacher, even more scared than me. 
She looked like she was going to cry. Anyways, she just ran into the school as fast as she knew. I could run without looking back. Today, I still don't know what that weird woman wanted, and if she followed me since the zoo, but whatever. To this creepy woman, let's not meet again. Hello, this is my first time sharing my story. I remember this story that happened to me a long time ago, and it still scares me to this day. I was about 15 at the time. Being young and dumb, I always snuck out at night to meet with friends. This time, though, I was talking to a guy I didn't really know. Never met him in person, so I decided to meet with him at night at an elementary school maybe a mile or mile and a half from the house. I had no car or license at this time, so I walked. I ended up meeting with him for about an hour, got pretty spooked and just ended up telling him I was going to go back to the house because I was cold. He was very nice, offered to walk me back home, and I said no because he lived right next to the school and figured I'd be fine. This is the creepy part. I took a different way home because I had been caught by the cops a handful of times and didn't want that to happen again. Let me paint the picture for you. I'm walking in a neighborhood on the sidewalk. Houses on both sides of me and cars everywhere parked. There was an RV parked almost 10 feet away from me at this point. All of a sudden, I hear this really loud music and Men being really loud behind me. I look back and there is a little truck coming down the street. Music loud as hell with a driver and passenger and about three men in the back of the truck. Looked like high school football players. They drove past, catcalling me right when I was getting to the RV. So now they can't see me because of the RV. I then hear screeching of tires and I knew I was in trouble. My mission at this point is starting to fade, a little because I was scared out of my mind. The truck comes to a stop, and all I can think of doing is crawling under the RV. That's what I do. I see many feet running to where I was just standing on the other side of the RV. One guy says, Where'd she go? My heart is literally about to pop out of my chest. I'm holding my breath because I feel like they can hear me breathe. And the other guy says, everyone shut up for a second. Then it's silent for what seems like hours, but probably just a few seconds. Then the first guy says, get in the truck. She's probably in the next neighborhood. They then run back to their truck, making random weird noises and pill out. At this point, I waste no time. I get out from underneath and bolt as fast as I can back to my house. Inside the window, close my window, get into bed, and start to cry. It's 4.30 a.m. now. My dad will be up at 5 for work. I couldn't sleep at all. I never snuck out again. Thinking about it now, I'm not sure if they were drunk or in their right mind. I honestly don't ever want to find out what would have happened if they had caught me. Okay, when I was... Okay, so back when I was 17, something really scary happened. I used to think I was overreacting, but looking back at it, it was actually pretty terrifying. In the span of one week, I had three different instances where I believe I was being targeted for abduction or something of the sort. It all started at the mall. My parents were out of town for a week, so I was hanging out with a friend. We were sitting outside of the mall, and I was smoking a cigarette when this white car pulled up and rode the windows down. They seemed kind of sketch 
to begin with. There were four or three of them, I think. I can't quite remember, but they all had on the same sunglasses and seemed to be in their mid-thirties, late twenties, maybe. They looked to be Latino. One of the guys asked me for a cigarette. I was always pretty generous with those, but I did hesitate a little while I walked up to their car. Something just seemed off about them to me. They began explaining they weren't from this part of town, and they wanted some locals to show them a good time. The guy that asked for a cigarette never even lit it, and then kind of made it to a point seem like he didn't even smoke. They asked if we wanted to party with them. We politely rejected their offer, but I still don't forget how the one in the passenger seat said, we don't take no for an answer. They drove away slowly after he said that. I asked my friend if she was weirded out by them, as I was, but she actually said she thought they were just being friendly. I kind of shrugged it off after that, not thinking much more about it. The next day, I was at home pretty much all day, just chilling alone. I was blasting loud music in the house since my parents were gone on a trip all week. Later that evening, when I went to get the mail, though, my neighbor walked over to me, which was weird since they rarely speak to me. She asked me if I was okay. I was actually kind of confused. Of course I'm fine. Should I not be? Is basically what I said. She went on to explain that earlier she came outside to walk her dog and saw a suspicious-looking man in my yard and an unfamiliar white car parked out front. She said the man was looking in the window of the house and also in my car. Once he noticed her looking at him, though, he took off. She asked if he knocked out, but I wouldn't have heard it because of the music. I was pretty scared after that, and I called my parents to tell them everything, even the mail incident. But they didn't really believe me, I guess. They thought I was being paranoid and just told me to lock all the doors and to call the neighbors if I was scared. They said it could have been my cousin who stopped by, but... I asked him, and he told me that he hadn't been by the house. Later that night, a pretty nasty storm hit, and the power went out. I was not about to stay in a dark-ass house alone after all the weird shit that's gone on here. I called a good friend of mine and asked if I could stay with them and their family until the, my parents, you know, come home for the rest of the week. They believed me and were really concerned. They let me stay and even gave me pepper spray. I had one more final encounter a few days after that. I was in a Walmart parking lot buying. I was in a Wal <coughs> there it goes. I was in a Walmart parking lot after buying a few things. I was just sitting in my car responding to texts and finding music to listen to when a guy parks a white car next to mine and comes and taps on my window. I was pretty weirded out, so I only rolled down my window, just a crack. He gave me a similar talk as the one that the mall did, but a bit creepier. He said he wasn't from around town and needed direction to Starbucks. You could easily see Starbucks from the parking lot we were in, so I just pointed to it. But for better reason, he asked me again. I started to roll up my window, and he tried making small talk. And since he was kind of a creep, I don't want to be rude. He told me he liked to party and asked if I liked it too. I'm not religious, but him asking me this in the same way the guys from the mall did was just petrifying. So I immediately replied, no, no parting here. I just read my Bible. Then he went on about how I was very beautiful. I tried to roll the window up and ended the conversation, but he put his fingers in the window, which scared me, so I stopped. He told me I looked like Shakira and asked if he could take a picture with me. 
super sketch, right? I told him, no, I'd prefer not to, thank you. Then he asked if he could be in it with me. And I was like, dude, no, I got to go. Successfully rolling up the window this time, I bolted out of that parking lot. However, I did notice after I left the same kind of white car he was driving was following me now. I was driving a pretty far distance, too. I had to go to the mall to give my sister's husband a ride home from work. I like to take back roads, and this white car followed me all through the back roads. He followed me on the way to the mall. I got stopped at a railroad track, and it was getting pretty dark. It was just me and all the way to the mall. I got stopped by a railroad, and... It was getting pretty dark. It was just me and the white car. I thought he was going to get out of his car and try to snatch me. I had my pepper spray and my phone ready to dial 911. I was in tears. I was so glad the car left once I got to the mall. I had no real evidence that the car followed me and... That guy was really him, but I still found it pretty strange. A car followed me through every route I took. I haven't had any encounter since then. I have no idea why all of that happened. I just know it was absolutely terrifying. Hello everyone, and Happy New Year. I want to start off by saying that everybody in the story is safe, but it was one of the closest calls I've ever had in my life, and I feel like I have to tell my story in order to raise awareness. I live in a major city in practically the pit of hell state. Born and raised here, I'm very familiar with my surroundings. I'm also aware to the fact that my city is one of the worst hubs for human trafficking and living here can be very, very dangerous. Despite all of this, I've taken pride in knowing that I do everything I can to remain as safe as possible. I've had close calls before. Shady landlord gave a stranger copies of my key and the man tried to enter as soon as I was alone and other horrifying tales, and consider myself an avid murderino. I'm pretty prepped. At the time, I had two things of pepper spray, one of my favorite jacket pockets, and the other one velcroed to my desk at work. I also had two rusty pocket knives, one always on me, one in my car door pocket. Oh, and uh, my taser never leaves the back. I avoid shady situations, and despite being a small lady, I know my shit. Yay for self-defense classes. My point is, I'm a very paranoid small chihuahua, and I still got into a scary situation. On to the story, shall we? It is summer and hot as hell out. I've got a date with my favorite gal pal, and I swing by her place to pick her up. She tells me she has a job interview to go to first, and I agree to go with her. No big deal. She's a sweet, tiny thing from a small town in the Midwest, and very new to the city life, and the wild things that could happen here. As we drive into a different city, I ask her about the job. It's a modeling gig? Oh, cool. For who? I found it on a Craigslist posting. It's just sports clothes. The Craigslist thing sets a small, distant alarm off in my head, but I push it to the side. Where the hell are we going? Anyway, when we pull up to a Starbucks a bit outside of the city, the alarm in my head becomes a little faint. Relax, I tell myself. I've done a legit job interview at coffee shops before. There's always been a good reason. We arrive first, late still, but end up waiting about 15 minutes. Kind of weird, but 
cat's relieved. We're not the rude ones when she gets a text saying he's here. I look around the Starbucks and outside at the parking lot, trying to figure out who the mystery man can be. When I notice a tall, white-dressed man step out of the black SUV. He smiles at us as he approaches, and I figured that's our guy. I could have sworn that SUV had been parked there for a while. I ask Kat if she wants to step in line or grab a drink, but she's practically begging me to stay with her. Okay, I can do that. I don't think it's very professional, but I can't protest. The man named Jack led us up to the isolated table outside and doesn't say much about my presence other than it was okay for me to be there. I get on my phone and shoot a text to my fiancé explaining where I was and what I was doing. He shoots back a be careful and I sit pretty to watch the show. Jack had this strange accent that I couldn't place my finger on. Looking back, I'm not even sure if it was real. He starts asking Kat the usual questions, and I notice she's absolutely bombing the interview. She doesn't have much experience and didn't bother to bring a portfolio. But despite this, he doesn't seem to care. The alarm in my head is much louder than a whisper. But it completely bears when he asks if she'd be comfortable doing lingerie shoots as well. Dear sweet cat, saying she doesn't have an issue with it, but would prefer to mostly do sports clothing like they had discussed earlier. Yeah. She asked to see some of his work, and he pulls up a lingerie Instagram. All lingerie. No clothing at all. He holds it in front of her face and pulls it away immediately. And when she asks if there was more, she'd be doing Jack. He says that was it and hurries the conversation along. He says we need to go right now to his studio at a place he briefly mentioned the name of to sign some papers and get everything squared away. It has to be done today. He's not working tomorrow and his co-workers won't do it right. Cat agrees, and he turns his attention to me. Do you want to be a part of this, too? I immediately knew that nothing about this is professional. I look down at my beat-up docks and green cargo pants, a shirt that has flames and a slightly edgy top on, and can't help but scoff. That's really not my thing. I'm just the ride. He studies me for a second and then says we can all ride with him, directing his attention to Cat. No, I don't want to leave my car. We'll follow you. He looks offended that I butted in, but asks where we parked. Right in the front of the store. I got it. I pulled Cat to the Jeep and make sure we walked behind him. As soon as we got to the car, I locked the door and tried to keep from freaking out. We are not going. This does not feel right. What about the lingerie? Everything I say she has an excuse for. We pull out of parking lots and follow Jack's SUV, but the whole time I'm trying to figure out how to get out of this. Kat doesn't like the lingerie, and this would be a door for her and she desperately needs the money. What if it is legit? He was alone anyways. You have your knife and spray, right? Of course I do. But I'm also five foot two to this man's six foot three. Jack could very much have friends, and I don't want to possibly kill or be killed. I realize Cat is bad shit. We drive along as I talk to her, and we start driving out into the desert, the middle of absolute fucking nowhere. There's a driver in the road that prevents U-turns, and I get an eerie feeling that Jack knew to take us this way. I'm absolutely desperate at this point. I pull out my phone and snap a picture of Jack's SUV and the license plate. I upload it to Snapchat where friends can see it. 
Cal starts getting uncomfortable once she sees how far we have driven. The name of the place he mentioned springs back into my head, and I knew it's familiar from somewhere. A commercial jingle that's distant but catchy. It's a restaurant or hotel or something. He couldn't have a studio there. Please just look it up. So she does. It's a casino. Unless this man has rented out a space, he wouldn't have a studio there. It's not consistent with the information he gave us at all. Kat is completely fucking freaked out at this point. I tell her that this isn't uncommon and she was trying to confuse us the entire time. Throughout the entire interview, she had refused an hesitant look on her face like this wasn't what she was promised or expecting at all. Kat finally agrees that we need to get out of there, and I start to breathe easy again. I notice every five minutes or so, there's a break in the medians. It's a rough, quick stop and turn around, but it'll have to do. So I do it. And we absolutely gun it. Cat gets a call from Jack, and at first she ignores it. I convinced her to call him back, and she gets nothing at all. Like the number had blocked her. It didn't go through. I tell her to screenshot the Craigslist ad, but she can't find it anywhere. It's like every trace of Jack disappeared. We go back to her apartment. I tell her she needs to report it. She promises she will, but later because she doesn't want her husband to know. He didn't even know she had this interview to begin with, and she didn't want him to know about what happened. If I hadn't driven her, she would have gone alone without telling a soul, and God knows what could have happened. I tried not to scold her too badly, but... I just reminded her that our city was very different and much more dangerous than where she's come from. Sweet cat, I hope you're a little more awakened in the world, and I'm sorry for that. It's been a few months since we split away, and I'm still worried to death over all the obvious crazy things that you get into. Since the incident, I now take three pepper sprays one for the car, and a new pocket knife to carry around. Thanks, Dad. She's gorgeous. I'm almost four months pregnant and now finally ready to get out of this damn dangerous city. Please, 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 dear Redditor, be safe out there. It's such a scary world, and be damned careful with Craigslist. Jack, if you're really the scary guy my gut deemed you to be, fuck you, and let's not ever meet again. All right, dear listeners, this is the part in the stories I'll be reading in which some may feel extremely uncomfortable. I advise you, listener discretion is strongly advised. I was kidnapped by a Colombian guerrilla group and spent six months captive deep within the Andean forest. It was in the 90s at the peak of Colombia's modern violent period when illegally armed forces shared the countryside and ties with a booming drug dealing industry, both highly financed in part by a widespread of kidnap practices. The event was so generalized that likely most anyone in Colombia old enough today can relate with a personal story, a family member or a close friend that was in some kind of or another touched directly by the violence during the period. It was a cool December day when my friend was traveling by car from Bogadia City to our hometown in the northern part of country some 12 hours away. It was past Christmas, and in Colombia, this meant carnival season. We were set to spend the remainder of the holiday, New Year's, and 
the subsequent weeks with the rest of our family and friends, celebrating on one of the multiple regional festivities that spawn all over the country during the first weeks of the year. I was only 14 years old. Somewhere halfway, there was a roadblock in what seemed to be a military control point. Only it was not military at all. Several armed men in full camouflage patrolled in broad daylight, stopping cars and questioning the occupants. Luck had it that it was me who was sitting on the left side of the vehicle, behind the driver's seat. So, when after a few seemingly routine questions, we were all asked to step out, it was me who followed my father to the left, towards the open landscape. Conversely, my mother and brother stepped out to the right, against a hard rock wall. After a couple more trivial questions, the man, being at the driver's side of the car, pointed towards my father and me and said, quite blandly and a matter-of-fact like, Okay, so, the two of you are now kidnapped. These few words, spoken so lightly, took a while to really sink in. I remember clearly looking up at my father, not quite sure what he'd make of such blunt news. After a couple of uneasy seconds, my father said firmly and calmly, Okay, we'll go. Given the few instants the whole ordeal took, the weight of what was going on didn't really hit me at that moment. Rather than an abrupt crash, the process was more like a slow motion blur. Without really saying goodbye to mom and my brother, we obeyed the silent indications of the armed men who get off the road and step into the trees. Walking those few meters, we both looked back, me in confusion, my dad sending strong visual cues of strength and support to my mother. She screamed, the voice lingering on the air, until only a few paces in, when the thick Colombian flora swallowed us whole. We walked a few hundred meters into the forest and met a larger group of our men. Leaders from both parties exchanged some whispers, and then we resumed the walking. From there, we walked in silence for hours. This time to ourselves, was when everything began to take shape for me. So much walking in silence had allowed my mind to offer thousands of explanations of what could possibly be going on, only to eventually settle on the least creative and most obvious realization of the truth. I only managed to get through the day by having my father walking beside me, composed and stern, as ever, regardless of the doubtless turmoils he was fighting in his own mind. We only stopped when we came out of the woods to meet a highway. We waited, hidden until it was fully dark, in order to cross it and resume our walking, which continued long into the morning hours. When we finally arrived into a farmhouse and were offered shelter, farmers in this region some more than others, were used to having armed traffic come through and allowed passing, which seemingly looking the other way. No one said much, always an uneasy silence hanging over the group, which the farmer couple adopted instantly. The next day, we were surprisingly served a large breakfast, surprising only by the circumstances, but not really by the context of where we were. After a coffee supply, we moved on and got back to walking. This routine kept up for a couple of days. We walked, stopped at some house, farm, or ranch, spoke seldomly, and walked again. My father and I spent New Year's Eve holding hands in silence, lying on the floor and holding back our tears, trying to keep our eyes closed and faces straight. By January 3rd, my father managed to hold some conversations with our captors, 
convincing them that my mother would need help sorting everything out. Being captured, he argued. He was unable to facilitate any negotiation. Eventually, they agreed to release him in order to work something out, just to get me back. I keep today and cherish fiercely the memory of my father holding me at arm's length, hands on my shoulders. We were nearly the same height, but that day he towered over me, calm and stern as ever. If only in his demeanor, he looked straight into my eyes and said, I will come back for you. If today I write these lines, it is only because that statement was true. It wasn't even a promise. I don't think that the words were even meant for me, but rather for himself. He was vocalizing his plan, acknowledging that it was a hard fact. That was all I needed to know. He turned and walked briskly into the foliage. I followed his back until he was gone. What happened next could fill books, and this has run as long as is. I was eventually released in mid-June, and for those months I traveled through a spiral of self-discovery that has strongly, but not solely, molded whom I've become. A few thoughts that overarch the whole experience. There was lots of walking involved. We seldom stayed more than one or two days in the same place. I think the longest we stayed out during all of these months was five nights. Walking was a huge part of our routine and one that I appreciated greatly. Never mind that I was always among a group of army men. While walking it was just me, my mind and nature crunching under my boots. I enjoyed being left to my thoughts. Still do. Certainly, I learned that this mind can be a man's best friend or worst enemy. Besides, Colombia's landscape, forests, and rivers are breathtaking. I cannot relate with only feel terribly compassionate for all those people who have been held kidnapped in closed quarters, dark spaces, the agony of such circumstances on top of everything else that these situations imply. It's mind-blowing. I slept on a hammock and became very adept at quickly setting it up and bringing it down. We usually slept under the stars, so I also found peace gazing into the night sky and trying to hone in on my astronomy basics. This wasn't always possible because it rained a lot, so we set up plastic canvases to refuge under. One of my all-time most miserable nights was below a thunderous thunderstorm that lasted throughout the night, shredding whatever we tried to use as shelter. It made me empathetic towards so many people that have nowhere to go when it rains. I was not alone. A few weeks in, our group fused with another that held someone else. It took a while, but eventually, they let us connect and our mutual presence gave each other strength. The other man was very depressed, he was older than me and starting a family, newly wed with a baby on the way. It was a devastating time to find himself in this situation. I eventually managed to make him laugh. We called ourselves roommates, and we became our own little support system. Our only link to the outside world was a little Sony radio that had this cool retractable wire antenna that could extend for some four meters. We hung the antenna on tree branches and managed to hear only two stations, a rock radio station and the audio of a national TV channel, of all things. Through this device, we kept on top of the news. I remember hearing about Clinton's first inauguration. 
the rise of Escobar hunting illegal cartels, and the successes of one of Colombia's rising football stars in the Italian League. I owed my sanity to that little radio, and the rock station especially, since it was full of those trivial shows and contrasts that reminded me of the lightness of everyday life. I wrote the station thanking them for their company once I got out. Remember, it was the only gas station we got. They never responded back. We got supplies from market runs performed around once a month. Someone would already leave early, and we then rendezvoused in the afternoon to a set place, different from where we separated. They would go into some town and get soap, shampoo, cooking ingredients, batteries, etc. They sometimes allowed us to request small things if they could be easily obtained. I got some pens and notebooks, a toy chest, and whatever books they could come across. I read about eight books total, but nothing too interesting, considering it was just one of these men grabbing whatever he found on, you know, some small town grocery. I remember a couple of Wayne Dyer, not amused, and Kazazaki's. It was okay. I had my 15th birthday party sometime within this period. I celebrated bashfully with my roommate by regarding a giant sour sop or guanabana fruit as close to a cake as we could get. These are normally melon size, so when we found one, like a large watermelon, we thought it appropriate for celebrating. We found victories in little things like that all the time. As a present, he gave me an unopened piece of white underwear briefs that had just arrived from the last supply run. I kid you not when I state just how precious new underwear was. So it was a big deal of a gift. The magic did not last, however, since the very next day. While I wore them for the first time, our group became alerted of some military presence nearby, and we were made to walk extra this day, going nonstop for hours. Without giving it too much detail, suffice to say that by the time I was able to stop, I found that I had blemished the snowy white fabric. Beyond any washing capacity available to me in this forest, this was one of the few moments I cursed my luck and caved to the despair of my situation. Speaking of birthdays, I miss my brothers. I miss the birthdays of my two young cousins, pretty much sisters to me who were told some lie to keep them from worrying. I missed Mother's Day. I missed lots of uneventful days, idle time with family and friends, stolen to never get back. I missed school. One of the most dreadful aspects of kidnapping is that you never know when it will be over with. My optimistic brain always thought it was on the verge of ending. Our minds are wired that way. I remember thinking, during the first weeks that my classmates would never believe my story once I get back to school after the holiday period was over. Never even crossed my mind that I would miss the first day of classes by the end of January. When I eventually made it back to school, it was August. This delusion of always expecting a near outcome also helped me greatly. If I had been told from this start this would take months, I would have survived a lot more easily. Remembering this also helps me keep perspective. Just as I can't relate with people who experience closed isolation, I cannot start to fathom what it must be like for all those who have lasted decades in captivity. In Colombia, Today still, hundreds of cops and military personnel remain kidnapped, taken since those days decades ago. They've seen their years come and go, 
away from their families, separated from their kids, who are now grown men and women, and only remember them through faint images. Time is the most precious resource, and as ever forward-moving beings, we can never get it back. To have it taken away from us in such a cruel, violent manner, even for a moment, is a nefarious atrocity. I mentioned we had to move hastily and longer than usual. When we brushed with military forces, it wasn't often, maybe at around once a month. It was scary, though, because for all practical purposes, my roommate and I, just two more of them, we all walked together in a closed pocket dressed alike. The only difference for some looking close enough was the two of us were unarmed. I am sure we didn't even look uneasy after a while during our regular walks. So, when we had to shuffle, we always feared to be mistaken for an illegal group as a whole and being engaged with accordingly. Once it came close, I was bathing on a small pond, and when all of a sudden we heard a helicopter came out of nowhere, our group scattered frantically to get cover under some big rocks, and within seconds the aircraft was easily seen above us. They circled, hovered as in scanning of the area, and fired a small burst of shots. Hearing the bullets piercing the water surface and seeing the fine ripples of the water made me tremble. If seen, there was no way for any soldier to know I was not one of them, so I was forced, just as much as anyone else, to remain concealed. When nothing moved after the shots, the helicopter flew off. We gathered our stuff quickly, picked up camp, and left. On that note, I'll add that these guys were good. If you visited our campsites five minutes after we were gone, you would never have imagined any human had touched this nature in ages. Clearly, decades of wilderness life had left their toll on these people. The first Colombian guerrillas were formed and took to the mountain around the 60s, I do believe. Speaking of these people and the toll taken by their decisions, it was sad realizing that for many of them, this was the only life they knew. I got to know around 20 or 30 people in changing groups over the six months. Most all of them joined early on as children, mostly recruited out of pressure. The usual tactic back then was getting close to farmer families and helping them with some of their issues. Usually it involved payback vendettas for violent crimes against the family, like the killing of a brother or father. Who knows what was actually true, but it all concluded that the guerrillas convincing young boys that they'd help avenge their fathers, soon followed by requesting in exchange that they should join and help avenge the next guy. After a while, the boys found themselves amidst criminal activities from which they could not get away. Young minds are easily molded. Today, guerrillas in Colombia have lost their character as social or political movements, focused only in profiting enough to keep their wills turning. Yet, however, all the drugs and kidnapping money is going lower levels of the organization, which never sees it. Communication between groups is fragmented, and resources scarce. So these people spent their lives in utmost austerity, fighting for the wrong causes, believing all the crap that's been fed to them since they were kids, taken from their homes. In more ways than one, they were just as prisoners as we were. They couldn't go anywhere. They couldn't leave us. They couldn't make their own choices always following some third-hand instructions, always subject to the whims of unknown faces, always prisoners for their own 
circumstances. This is not escaping them from their criminal acts and responsibilities. But at least during all this time, in my mind, I had a different view of the world to go back to. For many of them, smart, hard-working people like any of us would be contributing toward members of society. Should they have opted for their other choices, this was all the world they knew. The person kidnapped takes the least amount of suffering. The most awful quality of this crime is uncertainty. Not knowing the when, the how, the where can drive someone mad. As a protagonist, you know a lot of things. You know you are alive. You know you are well. You are fed. You are moving. Your only responsibility is to stay calm. Be patient. Keep it together. Don't do anything stupid. Live one day into the next. Families, they get the worst part. They feel the responsibility, the urge to take action. To just do something. The outcome is in their hands. Plus, they know nothing beyond whatever the captors decide to share. I spoke with my family twice during the whole period, through a two-way radio. Then, once I answered some questions in writing for survival proof. Other than that, blank. Thinking on how my mother would be worrying as a tough shadow that followed me everywhere. Besides, these people were decent to me as far as interaction goes. No need to be overly rude or aggressive if we are supposed to coexist. If not family, they understood this and opted for us to keep calm. They were professionals after all, but in their interaction with my family, for the very same reasons, they were hostile, aggressive, threatening. It was part of their communication tactic to get their way, I guess. So, the people outside have the worst part. Nearly six months into this ordeal, we were released. We were given rough directions on how to reach the highway. We walked away warily, nervous, but with every step our confidence grew. A few minutes in, we were running and laughing. The plan was to reach the highway and get a lift into whichever town that was next up. There was no one supposed to meet us or expect us. You would think we would rush out of the forest as fast as our feet could carry us, and it just wasn't quite so. Again, not an abrupt crash, but a slow motion blur. We savored every step of the way out. We reached a nice pond and stopped to bathe, to refresh. We took our time, changed our clothes, and moved on without any pending haste. I had grown fond of the forest, of my hammock, of the stars. Not that I didn't want to leave, but it was a process, one that warranted its due respect. We eventually found the road, and after a short while, a car found us that had apparently been looking for us. Even though we were told otherwise, our families were in fact told to expect us, and instructed to send a car. We arrived into town by nightfall, where we finally met with our families on a park. I have to pause a little every time I recall this moment. When I saw my father and jumped into him, it took him a few seconds to realize who I was and what was going on. He fulfilled his task. He got me out. My mother and brother were also there. And it was just as indescribable to portray what it was like. I'll just leave it by saying that the other people at the park never guessed why so much commotion. Life-changing consequences? Sure. It was a wild ride that marked me. But... Not in a bad way. 
not entirely. I never lost trust in people or in traveling by car. It was, however, many years before I was able to go back on that route and visit our hometown again. We followed up for a while, but I lost touch with my roommate eventually. I like to think this was as it was meant to be. By confining his memory to these episodes alone, I really appreciate the role he played in my life. No sense in pretending we would become lifelong buddies. We each urged to get on with our lives. We looked at each other, smiled silently as accomplices, and went our own ways. I appreciate time. I appreciate nature. I appreciate the never-ending company of my mind. I sometimes long for hammocks under the starry nights. Then... I remember the downpours, and I appreciate where I've come. I appreciate my family, having people care for you, someone to actually come home to. I love my country. Don't hold anything against it. Sometimes bad people get the upper hand, but sometimes they don't. It is different now. Colombia has regain some of its sovereignty, yet it is still ironing out some issues. I despise crime. I despise hurtful actions. I am politically harsh in my views as to how this conflict has evolved and how it affects everyone. I value freedom as the most underrated gift, which has been fought for ferociously. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true kidnapping stories. Before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elliott, Sugar Spite, Tina Mead, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Les Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S., Kwame Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all for remaining pillars that hold Back to Ashes Up. Thank you to the subscribers or just the listeners. Your appreciation keeps this channel alive, and I can't thank you enough. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.